Welcome everyone to Decolonizing Law, uh, an interdisciplinary series of public lectures on topics concerned with the relationships between law, race, imperialism, colonialism, anti-imperialism, and the anti-post-colonialism. I am Alonso Gurmendi from UCL. I am delighted to introduce this lecture series, which offers a stellar all-women lineup of amazing speakers. Today's lecture is Amaya Alves Marin. Uh, this series has also had the presence of Vasuki Nesaya, Liliana Obregón, Mindy Chen Wishart, Tendai Achumi, Asli Bali, Fabia Fernandez Carvalho, and Aicha Chubukchu. The final lecture in this series will feature Vidya Kumar. Today, uh, Amaya will be speaking about rights of nature in the forthcoming Chilean constitution. Every Today's speaker is member of the Chilean Constitutional Assembly, Amaya Alves Marin. She's a lawyer, academic, human rights activist, and defender, and nowadays a representative of the region of Bio, Bio in the Chilean Constitutional Convention. She holds a PhD in law from the York University of Toronto in Canada, and she's a full professor at the University of Concepcion in Chile. She's a researcher in the Center for uh, Water Re Resources for Agriculture and Mining, uh, and is part of an interdisciplinary a research group in human rights and democracy of the University of Concepcion. Uh, through her academic and scientific research, uh, she has written a number of papers on constitutional law, human rights, water regulations, indigenous people's rights on both national and international academic publications. Her lecture today is entitled Live to Tell, Rights of Nature in the forthcoming Chilean Constitution. We are deli delighted to have you here with us and I am very much looking forward to your lecture. Uh, I give you the floor for uh, 35 minutes. Thank you. Thank you many thanks. So thank you very much to UCL and to all professors organizing this uh, series of talks. Um, um, Amaya Alves, I'm currently uh, in a leave in an absence uh, from my university. So I'm working at the Constitutional Convention in Chile. And, it has been a big challenge because for the very first time, all ideas that I've been thinking over time, I need to put them uh, like, a, like down to a paper and think of it as real constitutional norms that need to be addressed on the ground. So it has been a different, like a very different academic experience uh, in the way uh, in which we think of the world and in the way in which we can address those topics and make them work in a constitutional norm. I have a presentation, I hope I can share it with you. Okay, so I'm, I was thinking of a paper that I wrote a couple of uh, months back about the rights of nature in the new Latin American constitutionalism, because this has been a topic that has been addressed in several Latin American constitutions that have I've been, working on those ideas from a comparative perspective, but for the very first time I need to address this here in my own uh, country. So it has been kind of a, an interesting example how uh, ideas can be addressed or not and how this new paradigm kind of collapse or clashes uh, against what we all, all always thought of uh, how nature could be addressed in constitutional terms. So, I need to say that constitutionalism and constitutionalism uh, and constituent processes in Latin America look a bit different from what we normally know from liberal constitutionalism. And this idea of popular participation in constitutional making is actually new, even new for Latin America. So in the actual Chilean process, there are social movements, there are indigenous people for the very first time. And women, we, there is a paritarian institution. We are half of the convention, um, like 77 members are women and 77 members are male. So this paritarian for the very first time uh, constituent uh, convention is actually quite different from what we had previously. So our role uh, in this, uh, process has been so breathtaking, so different from what we had in the past, that people are kind of a little bit uh, impact, like scandalized. People think, how can you, how can we, how can these people be re, uh, like uh, writing the constitution and how these people could be actually taking the spot of what in the, in the previous era were experts or academics, even I'm, I'm of this dual kind of membership. I'm an academic, but at the same time, I'm a woman. I'm from the regions, I'm not from the capital. 
I'm half Mapuche, so indigenous. So this is kind of an interesting mix to be part of the process now. Uh, but this is really relevant. That's why I put it up front. This challenges for what we thought is liberal constitutionalism normal scheme. And then I, I know you knew, you know that I guess, but uh, this all started with protests, like a huge social unrest in October two thousand nineteen, and it was really like, but a very kind of few thing, like the fare for the metro for the subway was increased, um, and then. People start to think it's not 30 pesos, which is very few money. It, it's, it's the idea of having, of not having social rights. It's the idea of the nature being commodified. And we already had had a couple of years back a process that failed because there was a ring, a ring wing uh, veto at the constitutional, uh, at the National Congress. So we already had a process that was a failure. And then uh, this social unrest in 2019, this is a picture of a very central square that was, it was uh, under the name of a military and they rename it a uh, human dignity. They call it the dignity square. And then all protests were kind of based there. Uh, in, in October. And the, what they did right after was a political agreement. And this political agreement from November 2018, like open up this constituent process. Um, and it was a different process. And you can see in this picture, there is uh, Gabriel Boric. And he's now, uh, he just um, took uh, like the place as a national president, as the youngest president in Chilean history. He's only 36 years old. Um, and he's from, from a, like a left political party. The, like the, the whole party didn't, uh, wasn't part of the political agreement, but he was part of it. And he was really kind of uh, compelled in the sense that he needed to be part of this uh, gate for the constituent process that we started. In December, I had a, a small chronology. Sorry to take this few moments kind of to give the context, because if not, uh, I guess it's more difficult to understand what, what is at stake, what is the debate like going on right now in Chile. So we had the first um, constitutional amendment in December 2019. They opened up for a referendum for the idea of a convention and from an end referendum, at the, at like, at like an exit referendum to approve or not the new text. And we had had in between two uh, very relevant amendment to the constitution. One in March, 2020, that's established that the constitutional convention will be a paritarian institution, like half of it for women, half for men. We had a, in October, 2020, um, the, the first referendum to know if like Chileans wanted or not a new constitution. 78% voted yes, we want a new constitution. And we needed to decide between two institutions, one with a part of the parliament uh, members being part of it, what we call a mix, like a mixto, half uh, elected and half uh, parliaments. But the other option was entirely elected and that, uh, option like entirely elected like constitutional convention won by 79 percent so it was obvious that that like a vast majority of Chile wanted the new constitution and being uh, and this being done by the constitutional conventions like fully elected we had another very relevant uh, constitutional amendment in december 2020 that for the very first time in chilean history reserved 17 seats for indigenous people this is huge because in chile uh, although around a 13 percent of the entire population i self identify themselves as indigenous we never ever in the past have had other constitution any recognition we always call ourselves chileans in, a, in, a, in one nation state that is the Chilean state and is one nation. And we never, for example, discussed that there were different nations represented by those indigenous peoples. And in my 2021, we were elected, uh, voted for it. I was elected by BOB is where I lived. We are 100, we were 155, but there was a little scandal where one of them needed to resign. So since September from last year, we have been 154. And uh, from July um, 
2021 until July of this year, we will be drafting the new constitution. And 60 days after, so around September from this year, we need to do an, another mandatory referendum to ratify the text that we, we will draft throughout this year. Um, and what what are we what have I've been researching and published about uh, nature and then and then I'm obviously <laughs> working around that for the new constitution is this idea of a new paradigm uh, about how we could uh, norm our coexistence with nature how if we address it from another perspective and then this idea of another perspective is really relevant the knowledge, the ancestral knowledge of indigenous people. So that's where the two things intertwine. Like the, the two things are really aligned. This idea of going back to the knowledge of indigenous people and take uh, their knowledge, their view, their worldview as relevant to give another uh, normative framework for nature in the constitution. And the work that I've been doing in the past with of course, some of my doctoral students and, and law students are about rivers. And I think rivers are a good example because there are a lot of uh, jurisprudence and a lot of uh, doctrinal work around rivers, not only from a legal perspective, that's the, the other interesting thing. I don't think in, a, in the modern constitution, uh, like 21st century constitution, you can only work with law. I think we need to do a, like a, like a much broader um, examination of the, the, the life we want to live, the, the way in which our political society organize themselves. So I'm taking rivers and as an example from a comparative Latin American perspective. In the last paper, the, the one that I will be briefly talking about, we took a river from Colombia, a river from Ecuador, and a river in Chile. And we tried to address the difference between their legal framework and the impact on those rivers because of their legal framework. Okay, so uh, one paradigm, the one that we have been using so far, is this idea of nature as an object. So the idea of the constitution talk about nature by commodification. And the, and the problem is that this very idea of domination, alteration, and exploitation of nature, because it, it serves humans, then nature is at the service of the human being, um, has led us to a very deep socio-ecological crisis. So it's not only climate change, it's an ecological crisis that actually makes it difficult to believe that we will survive. I mean, the sixth uh, extinction of species that is going on right now could actually tackle us uh, as a species like living on earth. So, I guess um, it's urgent to think of nature in a different perspective. In this very way in which you could think differently of nature doesn't need us to go maybe further. Maybe it, it, it will help if you think of law in a different way, like looking backwards or looking in a more broader perspective and think of other people that think about nature in a different way. So, um, So what we did is we published a paper in 2021 in October in the Journal of Human Rights and the Environment. And we took rivers at natural entities that could lead us to a much broader perspective on how to tackle uh, not only rivers, but nature in general in a constitution and how we could actually protect rivers uh, from a legal perspective. So uh, we took, as, we, as I said, uh, three rivers, Vilcabamba in Ecuador, Atrato in Colombia, and Loa in Chile. And for example, the river Loa, and I will go, I think we had a map, sorry to go to the map and I go back here. Okay, this is the three rivers, the three case studies that we took. If you see the picture, the Atrato River is a, is a river from the jungle, from the Amazonia. And, 
And it was interesting because at the Colombia Constitution, at the Colombian Constitution, nature is not um, entitled to human rights. But what they did, and they have done this in the past, is that the Constitutional Court took the river, and it says that the river rights are intertwined with human rights. So the people who live nearby the river and those rights could be transformed in a sort of an hybrid rights that are partially owned by persons and partially owned by this river itself. And this was a decision, the Atrato River in 2016. It was very, very famous but because uh, what happened in the Atrato River, there was mining and the mining, like uh, it was contaminating the river in such a way that people who live nearby the river were suffering too, mostly indigenous people and, and tribal uh, groups. So this was a very, uh, I would say, leading decision for the Constitutional Court in Colombia. The role of the Vilcabamba River was a bit different because the Vilcabamba River in Ecuador was part of the, the decision, was part of the new constitution. And the new constitution in Ecuador, 2008 new constitution, recognizes rivers as uh, entitled to fundamental rights. So there are the subjects of those rights. And there is a, an open action, and like a, a public action or class action that anybody could uh, defend the river before the courts and is entitled to ask for that protection before the courts in Ecuador. And if you see the lower river, which is the third river that we uh, were examining and researching, is the river that runs through the desert in Chile, in northern Chile. And actually, it was uh, exploded at such a point that last year, like the year 2019, it was declared dead. I don't know if you knew, but rivers can die as well. Not only because they disappear until they don't have a water, but they, they can also uh, run in a way that, for example, in, during uh, some periods of time, you don't have uh, water, like what we call intermittent rivers. So the lower river was declared dead in 2019. And what we did is we searched for the legal uh, framework in order to know what each of those le uh, legal frameworks could have done for the rivers in, in terms of well-being. So I will go briefly that. So in Ecuador, there are the rights of nature and this idea of a relational and ecocentric perspective. Um, in Colombia, what they created through that case, the Atatoria was what they call biocultural bio, bio rights. So this idea of local communities as guardians of the rivers. So they are part of, partially part of it. And in Chile, uh, we have an anthropocentric uh, vision and right, only a right to a healthy environment. But there's also this idea that the environment is at the service of the human being. So this is the current paradigms that are being addressed. So why we took rivers as, as subjects of law? Uh, we thought that rivers could help us uh, give a good example that could be extrapolated after to the entire nature. So it could be operationalized at rise of nature. We also found that there has been emblematic cases about rivers, not only in Latin America, but in other parts. In India, we found a very interesting case about the Ganges River. And this idea of the revolution for the rights of nature that we saw in some scientific um, papers and scientific reviews could be addressed as emblematic cases. And also we found out that the health of rivers is critical. And for the ecosystem's uh, integrity, what happened to rivers is really crucial. So we have some data that only 33% of the world larger river retain the natural flow without interruption. And this is very relevant for the cycle, right? what we have said from the mountains to the rivers to the sea, and this is kind of in danger too. So we took rivers as our main example. And we also discover, if you see this jurisprudence review, that in the last year really, between 2010 and 2020, 
we saw more and more cases about rivers and about this legal debate if rivers should or not be entitled, be subjects of fundamental rights. I'm not sure if this is a topic that you also addressed in England, uh, in the UK, if you talk about rivers and, and how rivers could be handled, if rivers have uh, natural rights, because if you think of rivers as having rights itself, it could actually put into question what do we do normally for to rivers. For example, to build a wall or to build like a whole frame of uh, like around the river, because one of the examples of a well-being of a river is the natural flow, so that it could kind of go this way. But what we do is we build walls to it. This could be a, an, I would say, an aggression to a river well-being right, or the way in which we build dams to stop the water from flowing. This could be also addressing another right of of natural flow for rivers. So if we really think the way in which we interact with rivers, if we think of them as entitled to rights of well-being, actually we could actually need to address things that we take for granted. And between 2010 and 2020, we have had lots of cases. So not only in Chile, we have one case, like one big case of Loa River. We had also an interesting case about La Liwa and Petorca for uh, the human right to water. Because what we have done in the, in the previous years is um, take all water from the rivers. So some of the rivers don't exist anymore because we kind of took everything, we exhausted them. And then in Colombia, we found many, many cases. Uh, after the Atrato River, which is the leading case, we found many, many cases. And also in Ecuador. Um, in Ecuador, we found many interesting cases. So actually, this is kind of like getting huge in the last 10 years. So we thought this is relevant. This is something we need to address from a, from a, like a research perspective. I already show you this. And in terms of comparative law, uh, because we were using Ecuador and Colombia as an example, and, and the idea we, we thought this way in which comparative law has been used in the past, in the past it has been used as uh, the law between civilized nations. And from this perspective, actually, I found out in our current uh, constituent process for example, Ecuador is not a big example. And I think we still see comparative law from a civilized perspective. And for example, if I, if I gave an example from UK, I guess most constituent uh, members will say, oh, that's great. Or if I give an example from France or from Germany, but when I give examples from Latin America, it's always a bit from a, from a part of the constituent members, uh, like a bit of distance. And from others, it's really relevant. So there's a difference between, for example, when indigenous people give example from Bolivia, it's very kind of obvious that it, it is a good example to take or Ecuador or of others. But there is still this debate or this tension between where the comparative example comes from. And, and we, we try to look beyond law and to take, for example, scientific disciplines, so river science, like a lot of the data we put in this paper was river science. And we see now at the Constitutional Convention, the more and more people use uh, scientific knowledge. And, and on the other hand, we also propose to look at indigenous world's view. Um, so think of water, think of rivers, think of nature from another perspective. And this, uh, it, like allow us and this demand from us a legal pluralism approach. And I'm very happy because um, to tell you that some of the, I mean, so far we have 56 uh, constitutional provision being approved. So we are at this stage where we are already addressing proposal of constitutional norms that we debate and vote at the plenary of the constitutional convention. You, we already have a norm at the, it's not the constitution because we have a, a, a referendum by the end, like a mandatory referendum by the end, but we already as the constitutional convention have a provision on legal pluralism. And it says, so it's in Spanish, so I will do my best to translate. 
says that the states recognize the normative system of indigenous people, which by using their right to self-determination coexist in an equal uh, normative uh, standard with the national judicial system. Uh, both need to respect the human rights established by this constitution and the human rights charters from which Chile is part. And then the law uh, would address the uh, mechanism for coordination, cooperation, and conflict resolution between both indigenous, both system, the indigenous legal system and the state, uh, and the, uh, yeah, state, uh, institutional state. Uh. This has been like a breath, uh, like a path-breaking adoption of a legal, of a constitutional norm that accepts that indigenous peoples are not barbaric anymore, but they have their own legal system. And we need to address those in terms of um, equal. Uh, this, this was considered like a, like a, <laughs> I don't know how to uh, say it in, in, like a huge, this was at the front page of legal, uh, of papers like all over the country. And at the same time, uh, one of my friends that come from the US says, it's the first time I see in a protest, like a, like a sign that says legal pluralism. It's the first time I see someone going to a protest, like a social protest on the street with like a sign saying legal pluralism. So this was debated on the street. It was huge as the constitutional convention and now it's a legal provision, it's a constitutional provision that we will uh, put forward uh, for the re final referendum. Um, so this actually opens up this, the door to discuss this uh, in a much more proper way in, in the worldview of, of indigenous people, actually. Um, so indigenous people, um, as you know, uh, for sure, <laughs> have this common experience of colonialism, this possession and attempted assimilization. This is the case in Chile. And also uh, we have been in a political subordination, economic exploitation, and cultural devaluation. This, this was the case for Chile up until now. And of course, the legal system uh, doesn't have not allowed to speak, interact, and act indigenous people up until now. So this is the first time with these 17 members of the Constitutional Convention that we have been addressing all indigenous issues. And it's interesting because some people said, uh, like right-wing members of the Constitutional Convention, I've heard this myself saying, in good faith, I didn't know that indigenous people existed in such a strong way, that they had a worldview, they had their own language, and they had it all, they hold their own legal system. So they say, I've never imagined that this was really the case. And I need to think in good faith that it has been assimilated in such a way that it has been made invisible for so many people, um, but it's not anymore. And we had it on the table and we took these decisions and we voted and, and the, the vote was relevant because we needed 103 votes out of 154. So th two thirds of the convention in order to approve it as a constitutional provision. So having two thirds is huge. Like it's, it's, it's very kind of, uh, like uh, I would say transversally in the terms that many uh, political uh, collectives, many uh, not only indigenous people, but like a lot of the political parties and a lot of the social movements that are part of the convention needed to agree. And, and of course, this need to think, we need to think of this very idea as something being born in the in the South and in Latin America specifically. So I could we could think of a constitutionalism of the global south. I, I would like to think of it as a constitutional uh, ideas that come from the global south. And then we could challenge with this very idea of rivers of nature being entitled to fundamental rights. We could challenge Western uh, constitutionalism, liberal constitutionalism. And of course, I like to think that way. And while Mapu is the name of the, in, in, of the Mapuche indigenous people, um, and then I, I will 
like to ask you if you think we could have a, some emancipatory potential in this very idea of constitution entitling in nature. It, why do I ask this from the Global South perspective? Because for example, one of the main activities, extractive activities in Chile is mining. And most mining companies are from Canada. So even though we think of uh, Chile as being in the periphery and of a very extractive economic, uh, economic uh, scheme, we need to think if this could lead us to a different perspective on nature that will impact or not our uh, extractive uh, economic uh, economy. I was thinking, I, I was talking last week with Luis Eslava from Kent University, and we were talking about the impact that global economy has on this very endeavor. If we could impact it, if what we draft in the constitution take into account the global economy and how the global economy impacts. And I think we are. I'm not sure if we will, uh, if we will uh, be able to redraft the rules in economic terms. Maybe that's too much to, to aim for, but maybe not. And, and this is one of the, uh, of the questions I had. And um, I'm all, almost done. Uh, I, I was thinking about messages from the research, but also from the examples that I gave you about the constitutional uh, constituent process, is to think that for, the, for once, Latin America is, I would say, ahead in the game or in the lead. This idea of incorporating in knowledge and worldview of native people to think of nature in a different perspective and to frame the constitution, uh, think of nature as entitled to fundamental rights, our, our well-being of rivers. They will, not only rivers, well-being of nature, they will help us take decisions in a different perspective. And this could be, of course, a, be a challenge to the way in which liberal constitutionalism has understood the role of human beings. We also um, accepted, not, not definitely in the text, but we have been talking about a, a, of species that are not human, of what we will have with animals that are not human, if they could have also recognition in the constitution and that what will entail that. Um, so a little bit of kind of letting our Eurocentric roots, this very idea of, of comparative being always civilized because it comes from Europe or, or from the global North being at stake. And this idea of a revision of the economic model and the capitalist logic that supports it, this idea of attractivism uh, with, no, with no limit, this unlimited extractive model um, this, this, that is actually imposed from the north, uh, that if we could can, uh, kind of take this uh, into question. And, and actually we give examples of alternatives uh, that of course are, are at stake and then we are debating and we have not uh, had this debate at the plenary. So there are not legal norms of the rates of nature that has kind of being admitted to the to the draft of the new constitution. So maybe I'd need to uh, get back to you when we have it. But I think we might be able for the very first time to address nature from a different perspective and debate about the well-being of nature itself. I started with rivers because I, I thought it was the best example. But indigenous people have been pushing this very, very hard forward. And, and of course, I, I think of myself as an ally for them at the convention. And, I think I need to keep you posted because we don't have this. And I just finished with this picture. I don't know if that happened elsewhere, but this is throughout the social unrest um, for the protests that led to this uh, political agreement and the new uh, constituent process. Um, they took this picture, it says new constitution or nothing. And I think this uh, shows a belief that we could through constitutional norm kind of reimagine the world we live in Chile. And sometimes, and I finish with this reflection, I find it hard because I'm in the middle of both. I'm, a, I'm an academic, I'm a legal scholar. And at the same time now I'm in this political position when I need to push forward some norms. 
and sometimes I found it difficult to challenge, to channel through constitutional provision what the expectation of people are on the streets. Uh, because I know what law has done in the past, right? Like, like the colonial system was imposed in Chile through law. So sometimes I think like non-lawyers, non-legal scholars have so much faith in law. And I found myself a bit uh, skeptical. I'm not sure if I can be skeptical because I'm supposed to be the one who, who will help them to channel legal change through law. But I found myself a, a bit more skeptical every day. So this is still a very beautiful picture. I see it once in a while to keep me, keep me on, the, on the hopeful side of this process. And okay, many thanks. And I'm looking forward to your question. Uh, thank you so much, Professor Amaya. Uh, it's a, it was an extremely interesting um, presentation. Uh, right now, we we are opening the the panel for for questions from the audience. Um, just as a reminder, we will not be identifying the people who make the questions because of uh, legal reasons. Um, uh, we have a question from uh, one of our viewers says well thank you for a wonderful presentation um and says can you please tell us more on the experience in chile trying to change the rationale behind environmental protection from one based on the exploitation exploitation colonial exploitation of nature for economic purposes what has been or you think will be the main challenge in terms of legal language Yeah, um, many thanks. Um, that's a good question. And, um, you know, I don't have the answer yet because what, what I see is that we have kind of different groups. For example, there is a, a big group uh, where indigenous members are, but also legal activists or social activists. And they will like to just put a veto on some activities. Like, like for example, don't admit uh, some kind of... Uh, industrial um, activities that could damage or that have been damaging in the past, like a lot of the, the environment. And I, I think we should actually restrain some of the activities, allow uh, for a, a much deeper uh, research on the effects or impacts of those activities. But I don't think we can a priori, like beforehand, just forbid them. I find it hard to, because I think there are fundamental rights that are related to, to economic activities as well. So I don't think you can put an absolute right in any, I mean, even if I like it, I don't, I don't, I don't as a legal researcher, as, an, as a, someone that has studied this in the past, I don't think we should put any fundamental rights in absolute terms, not, not even those related to the protection of nature. So I guess we could, uh, if you read a, a catalog of fundamental rights, if you just read it in a plain way, you will find many contradictions, many tensions, because all the time rights could collapse to each other, I mean, against each other in a context, in a certain context. So I guess, I will push for rights of nature, but I always will push for economic rights or for, a, I don't know, for, for example, now there's a big debate about the desalinization plants because we don't have water in Northern Chile. So there's a huge uh, debate about the impact of desalinization. And I, I'm thinking, of course, we need to research that, but if you need water, that could be, even if there is an impact, there could be desalinization plants for, for example, the right, the human right to water. And maybe we need to address in a better way the impacts. And there is ways in which you could address it. I don't know if I'm, if I'm explaining. I don't think you can just, because some people just think you need to forbid those activities. I'm not in favor of forbidding them. I think we need to regulate from an, and, and that's a good, like that's an interesting perspective. We need to regulate 
from a public law perspective, because one of the problems of the 1980 constitution, the, the constitution that we had under the military dictatorship is what they did is they regulate a lot the private interest much more than the public one. So I think that's why our public system is so weak. And we have been uh, exploiting nature in a way that doesn't make sense from a collective perspective, from a public perspective, from a common ground. So that's, our, I think, our aim. Thank you. Uh, I, I don't think we have any more. Oh, we have one more question from our viewers, so I, I, I don't get to ask my questions just yet. <laughs> um, uh, okay, so there's another question here asking if you think that there should be a special environmental court. Uh, if so, uh, should they have a, an active role in protecting nature as a, as a concept? Yeah, we, we do have uh, three environmental courts in the country, one in northern Chile, one in Santiago, one in southern Chile. The problem with that, I, I think we will still have those. Um, and there are interesting courts because, for example, one of the members of the panel um, is, is, a, is a scientist, not a, not a lawyer, not a jurist, but a scientist. So there are, their decisions are relevant because they put some uh, interesting data in, in, for example, I don't know, uh, chemical impacts or physical impacts, etc. However, I think those courts have not, um, I mean, has been taking decisions much more in favor of big companies because they have more uh, money, for example, to do um, what we call informe en derecho, which is a, like, a, like a report that goes to the court done by an expert. But like, if, like, like local communities or social movements don't have the money to pay for those reports, right? Um, so most of the data that the court will uh, receive will be from big companies. So people were saying that these companies at the end of the day um, decide or adjudicate in favor of big companies more than, than normal people. And the other thing that people said is those courts are in three different cities of the country, but um, it's huge. I mean, Chile is 6,000 kilometers long. So for example, I myself, I am 500 kilometers far away from the closest uh, environmental court. So if I want to litigate before that court and I'm a social movement or a local community, it has to, it, it will be very hard to be able to do it because I don't have the money. So what people were saying that we need to come up with a public litigation a kind of a center or, I mean, to open up for litigation so people can really think um, of uh, litigation of courts as something that will uh, guarantee the right to their access to justice. And I think this is one of the other rights that were um, already, there is already at the, at the constitutional draft, which is, um, so a jurisdictional, effective jurisdictional protection and the right of access to justice. So the constitution guarantees the full access to justice to every person and collective. The state should remove all obstacles, social obstacles, cultural, economic, that, um, that limit the possibility to access courts. So maybe through that provision, we could, um, I mean, be able to access the special environmental courts in a better way. Thank you so much. Um, Okay, I'm going to give a few seconds for people to ask their questions if they have any. I, I uh, see one in Spanish. Should I take that? Uh, sure. Yeah, I, I see there's there's oh, one yeah. one that just came in. Uh, says, uh, thank you very much for your presentation. It is inspiring to see this process in Chile. I am wondering if the Constitutional Convention is still facing criticism from indigenous peoples in the country on how the rights of nature are being discussed. Is it perceived as, a co as cohesive with indigenous cosmovisions? Uh, yeah, many thanks. Um, yeah, that's, that's a challenge, a huge challenge, because uh, I've been thinking of that too. Um, because indigenous people were never part of the conversation. And this is the very first time there are. So at the same time, because they had zero at any previous Chilean constitution, 
now they want uh, to be really part of it. And I've been, I've, been I've been struggling with that because sometimes they really want from zero to 100. And we've been talking about prioritizing because I mean, what we have at the Constitutional Convention as well is, is a sort of a political process of, a, of give and take, right? So you ask for something and most probably you won't have like 100% of what you demand, you will have part of it and you will be able to kind of uh, change partially and have partially what you demanded. And I'm not sure because indigenous people have not been part of this political conversation previously, how much they're willing to, uh, to give. I mean, they're willing to, uh, to let go and how much they're really demanding. For example, one, one demand that is really big and I'm not, I'm, I don't think they will be able to go back on that is the territorial claims, like their ancestral claims on territory. Uh, and I think they should. They should. They should keep on demanding that because territory is kind of attached to this very idea of being able to exercise their own worldview in political terms. I mean, self determination is attached to their domain, to their claims on territory in Chile. Um, and it's easier, for example, for Rapa Nui because it's an island and they have, have, they have had already control over the island. But it's really hard for indigenous people and indigenous people are 80% of the indigenous population in Chile and they're spread out. They were pushed out of their territory for so long, for 200 years. So now it's really hard to think of one territory for them. Um, but I think that a, rights of nature could be in the next constitution and could be in the next constitution thinking of indigenous people as their guardians. I've been, I've, we've been having that conversation and I think it's, it's, it's getting forward. Um, but it's hard because some, some indigenous people are not, um, are not trusting the results of the constitutional convention. Uh, so we will see. For sure, some people will be deceived. I, I don't think we have an option. And some people will be deceived. Some, I hope, will be uh, satisfied with the results. And I hope most of them will be satisfied of being part of the conversation in equal terms. Thank you. So we have another question. It says, uh, if the New Chilean constitution contained provisions explicitly recognizing the rights of nature, which mirror those in the Ecuadorian constitution, would this not give the Chilean courts an opportunity to balance conflicting rights and take the rights of nature into account in a way they, can, uh, they can't at the moment? Would you be in favor of provisions mirroring those of the Ecuadorian constitution? Yeah, very much. <laughs> I've been battling for that. <laughs> Uh, all the way. The thing is that, you know, I had many interesting conversations with uh, different members of the Ecuadorian uh, convention. Um, and I asked Acosta, which was the president of it. Uh, and this is a hard question, of course, when things already passed, like years after, and ask him, if you could do something different, if, if you go back and you could do something different, what will you do differently? And he says something very relevant uh, at the beginning of my, the, the Chilean convention. And I've been trying to do that all the time. He says, you know what? You don't, you cannot just look at the catalog of rights. You cannot use your whole energy just to uh, draft the catalog of human rights or fundamental rights. You need to look at the organic part of the constitution, at the way in which power is drafted and is, is uh, is contained uh, what Gargarella calls the, the e engine uh, room, right? The engine room. So uh, for the whole time, so for example, being a human rights lawyer and being a professor of human rights, I decided not to go to the human rights. We, we, we are separate in seven different commissions. So we draft the provisions in different commissions. So I decided not to go to the Fundamental Rights Commission, which was hard for me because it was at the, at the center of what I do. But I decided to go um, to the, um, we call it the Forma Juridicas Estado. So the state, uh, the way in which political power is territorially uh, divided. 
So if we are a unitarian country or we are a regional country or we are a federal country. And I went to that uh, commission and it has been relevant because I've been working with the engine uh, room. And for example, we already have at the draft of the new constitution a regional state which is a quite different state from what we had in the past, which was unitarian. So because I thought if we take decisions regionally, if we can decentralize the decisions, it'll be easier to address, for example, indigenous claims. In a region that is 80% uh, members of one indigenous, uh, indigenous people, uh, nation. So I think if we take decisions closer to where people live, in like every area, it could I could actually be much more responsive to demands from indigenous people, to demands from uh, social movements, to protection of nature. Because if you take the decision at the capital, you won't see the results of, for example, the impact on nature. But if you live right there, I think it will make much more sense to protect nature where you live. So, so far, so good. I've been only being part of this commission and trying to tackle the engine room. What Gargarella says is the engine room. And some people are doing another of these commissions. At least three of them are organic. And I agree with you in the sense that we need to have those uh, sections, those provisions in the Chilean constitution so courts, when they decide, will be able to kind of take both into account and uh, in that context, decide how much how much you can limit the rights of nature and how can you limit, for example, I don't know, economic uh, rights. I agree. Yeah. So we have four more minutes, so I wanted to take advantage of that and ask my own question. <laughs> uh, and in in a, in closing, uh, perhaps the the event, uh, if you could tell us uh, what are your overall your expectations for this very, you know, uh, momentous occasion in the history of Chile of where the the constitutional convention might might lead the country and and what are the uh you were mentioning for example we were talking on bans and how sometimes you shouldn't ban something but how far can the convention go for example in terms of a, a business and human rights and and the rights of consultation or even consent by indigenous communities and what kind of uh, pushback do you expect if if these aspirations are achieved from the global north flow from the capitalistic system that that the chilean constitution is going to confront yeah um, yeah that's the question <laughs> um, it's a hard question i'm um, yeah this double role of being an academic i'm on leave but i'm still an academic right i'm thinking of this all the time I'm thinking of or, or what I need to write afterwards, um, the papers that I need to write and the books that I need to, to work on uh, when the convention is over. But I think the first a big uh, challenge is to give a framework to public law in Chile, like a constitutional law. I really to think of, of protection of public, public rights, public entities, uh, this idea of a political community, I think it, it's not been addressed properly in the 1980 constitution, but also a catalog that um, look to the 21st century in a proper way, for example, social rights. That's a really, I think we can make a big change on that. And um, I think we can tackle the engine room in a quite different way. So far, I think uh, most of the convention is in favor of this idea of uh, decentralizing political power. And now we will have a debate, a very interesting debate on taxes. We want to decentralize taxes too. And I think that, that we will do front page of the papers again, because I, I didn't say that, but, but we have a huge campaign from, from social media. Social media are owned in Chile. I'm not, I'm not sure if everywhere, but in Chile are owned by, uh, by like very rich people, like the elites. The elites are political and economic and they're on the social media. So we have had a campaign or in the media that it's really huge. I mean, um, I could give you examples, but I mean, every day we do front page for something different because they take, I mean, we have give some examples to do this. I mean, I need to say this. I mean, some people have very kind of peculiar um, ideas about constitutional provisions and they 
address this at the convention and we make front page, but then they take a personal opinion they will never agree on, but they take it as the opinion of the convention. And then, I mean, we, we receive this backlash all the time. Um, in terms of consent of indigenous people, we already have a provision, a very interesting one, actually that we drafted at our commission says that um, people and nations uh, pre-existence to the state, so indigenous people, they ought to be consulted and they ought to uh, give their prior free and informed consent in all matters that could affect, affect them and their rights recognized by this constitution. So it's already in the new constitution. And they voted, we won this 403 votes. So just exactly what we needed. And then they read it, they read it again and people were like scandalized. So, but it's already in the provision of the new constitution. So I'm very happy about that. So I guess we will we will advance for sure. It will be a quite different constitution than what we had in the past. Um, but it, it won't be easy to improve to implement it, of course. It, it, it might help that I guess the new government is in favor of the constitutional, uh, of the constitutional convention and in, in favor of this uh, uh, like drafting of this new kind of framework for public law. But I said it yesterday, it, it will take us a generation. I think it's, it's mm. because a lot of people have so much hope that it might even be like a problem that they won't see it like next day. So I, I need to, I, I, I always say I'm working for my grandchildren and it will take a generation and that's all right. I mean, we need to do it slowly. Thank you so well, much. Thank you so much for this uh, fantastic presentation. Uh, it's been it's been truly uh, inspiring and informational and thank you everyone for watching and listening with us. Um, we look forward to seeing you in future editions of this uh, decolonizing law series. Thank you and, and have a good day.